Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The family of a San Antonio man being held at a treatment facility says Bear County waited way too long to stop moving people there from the adult detention center. As Dylan Collier discovered, the decision to suspend these transfers came well over a week after officials confirmed COVID-19 was inside the jail. They keep bringing people from the county jail. I think it is wrong because they are putting our lives in danger. 19 year old Alexis reads the words of her father, Larry Rodriguez, a Marine Corps veteran and for the past 114 days in counting, a resident of the county substance abuse treatment facility on Apple White Road. I think they are so wrong for taking these risks. April 5th, Rodriguez penned this letter to his family in which he claimed an inmate brought there from the jail ate, slept, showered, and attended classes with other residents before finally being put in isolation. I feel like it's just common sense that to help stop this virus, they should do the social distancing. It's very hard because he feels like he doesn't have a voice. Larry's wife, Maria Hernandez. They should have stopped that from transferring, uh, you know, uh, residents from one facility to another as soon as they found out about this virus. The head of Bear County Community Supervision and Corrections, which operates the facility, says the choice to temporarily prohibit people from being brought in from the jail was made Friday. Sheriff's officials said the decision actually wasn't made until yesterday. The same day, five more inmates tested positive. Regardless, the previous transfer rules remained in place even after people inside the jail had the deadly virus. The sleeping arrangements at the treatment center aren't exactly ideal when trying to stop the potential spread of COVID-19. County officials confirm up to 60 probationers sleep in a single dormitory. A perilous position for Rodriguez as he finishes his final couple weeks inside these fences. I'm concerned because I want my husband to come out of their life, not in a body bag. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Because of concerns of COVID-19 continuing to spread in state prisons, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice announced yesterday they will temporarily not accept inmates from any county jails or other facilities. And as major cities deal with the effects of COVID-19, rural towns are starting to get hit hard as well. Yesterday, Wilson County reported its first death that was from a resident inside the Frank M. Tejeda Veterans Home. We learned this afternoon a second person who came into contact with the first victim has tested positive and is in a San Antonio hospital. The Department of State Health Services is now investigating how the coronavirus got inside that facility that has been closed off now since March 9th. The DSHS has been in investigating to see where the, where that virus originated from. Uh, we have not ha received any details of that. The mayor of Floresville goes on to say that so far every resident in the wing the unidentified man lived in and staff that worked around him were tested on Monday. They're hoping to expand those tests to the rest of the staff and all others living in the facility this week as well. Currently, there are 12 cases in Wilson County. Four have since recovered. New at six, as Governor Greg Abbott begins to investigate avenues to reopen portions of the state, he says making sure companies and workers are safe to gather will be a priority. While Silicon Valley giants are working to figure out a master plan for this, a local nano company in San Marcos says it's already got a system that's a month away from startup. Ursula Perry explains its plan is to help achieve coronavirus containment. Quantum Materials in San Marcos is a nanotechnology company that already makes solutions to protect companies from counterfeiting operations. Using some of that same approach, it's now promoting QDX Health ID. It's an app to authenticate COVID-19 test results and make sure those who have the virus stay home and those who don't can return to work. It was fairly easy to adapt it to be able to be a solution for tracking um, these tests, the test results, um, and to be able to provide an immunity certificate or some, in, a, in electronic format that would allow people to be able to return to work. The need for authentication of test results and tracking comes after failures worldwide with problem test kits and a lack of a vaccine. The health provider logs into the app the same as the patient does. 
they they take the record of the test kit that that was used for their testing so it also will start to provide some of a uh, data tracking which tests are turning out to be accurate and which ones aren't qdx health id claims that their system would monitor patients tests and authenticate them even track them all the way through the period when a vaccine is administered certifying and clearing those who can go back to work and who needs further testing we if we return to soon and we don't have good tracking, um, it, 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 we could wind up in a worse situation. This is what that phone app would look like. The track and trace program could be up and running by June 1st, and its makers are now in talks with the governor's office to see if it could be adopted statewide. In the meantime, a beta trial is underway over the next month. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. The very first person in San Antonio to donate plasma as part of an experimental COVID-19 treatment, encouraging others to do the same tonight. David Herman, a former patient himself, says his symptoms were so mild, he only found out about his diagnosis after routine tests were taken at his doctor's checkup. He knows others aren't so fortunate. After recovering, the 54-year-old father of two donated his plasma, which contains COVID-19 antibodies, to be transfused into sick patients. He says the process, which already seems to have helped others, was easy. And when they put that needle in, you don't even feel it. I mean, that's the only thing you feel. And then um, 50 minutes later, you're done. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center on I-10 near Vance Jackson. Staff there wants potential donors to reach out to them for information before just showing up. There are requirements that you have to pass. We have information on all of that and more on KSAT.com. New at 6, a lot of groups are stepping up to help out those on the front lines. Nurses, doctors, and our first responders fighting the coronavirus up close and personal. As Max Massey shows us, North Rock Church is teaming up with Cruising Kitchens, HEB, and Black Rifle Coffee to help provide free meals and coffee. Been great but they've been wonderful and the food is amazing brooke hildreth is a firefighter and she was the first one lined up this morning checking in to make sure the cruising kitchen's makeshift drive through was up and running well we are going to be feeding all of our first responders as well as healthcare personnel between 11 and 3. we're doing it every day north rock church working with a lot of other organizations trying to help out those who are fighting the coronavirus sometimes up close and personal, really just trying to do their best to help out, make life as less stressful as possible. One bit of the weight off that they carry during the week, one piece of that weight off of them and uh, allow them to focus on what they're doing on the front lines of this pandemic. The goal is to feed at least 150 to 200 people every day. But yesterday alone, they handed out more than 550 meals. Honestly, we've already fed about 1,500. We've served about 1,500 meals in the past four or five days. It's pretty incredible. A lot goes into putting this drive through together. Hours of cooking, organization, and hard work. But the end result makes it all worth it. To uh, bless those who are blessing us and to give back to those who are giving so much to us. As for Brooke and her fellow firefighters, these are trying times, but they're doing their best to keep us safe and keep morale high. You know, we're, we're not out and about like we normally are in the community, so that's hard, but, but we're doing okay. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Love the effort. New at six, still at the heart of their learning from home is the art created by students at San Antonio's Henry Ford Academy. The focus of the tuition-free high school has always been art and design. Jesse DeGriato says these days creativity is helping them cope with anxieties and fears. Located for now at UTSA downtown, classrooms for the Henry Ford Academy are empty, but its students didn't leave their love of art behind. Welcome back to school. It's and still part of their learning from home. You know, art is really, really important to, to our students right now because it is that avenue to get them to express how they're feeling, how they're doing. I feel like it's important to make art that shows what is going on during this time and kind of express emotions that most people might not understand. In addition to more traditional art, Henry Ford Academy students are using items at home to create art, like this type of portrait mosaic made of clothing. Some things that I would never think of, you know, a sock, uh, a, an article of clothing, you know, a, a roll of toilet paper. Using their creative energy to help get their minds off of what's happening now or even find inspiration from it, 
they say holds many life lessons. Patience and time management, as well as understanding that things in life are going to be complicated. There's things in life that we can't control, um, but just understanding that we got to put our best foot forward. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Very creative. Absolutely. Let's take a live look outside with live cam 66 degrees out there. Oh, it was a chilly start to the morning. Did yeah. you get a chance to go outside? It was nice. Yeah. Yeah, but it, yeah, you definitely needed the long sleeves. Mm -hmm. Wanted some pumpkin spice latte. Remind, reminded really? me of November. <laughs> Put your request in. Let's go to Adam Kasky right now, who is live from our remote weather studio. Should we say that that way? Yeah. I guess that's a good way to put it. Remote weather studio at uh, Casa de Caski. I don't know, something like that. But Yeezy's already <laughs> craving the uh, pumpkin spice. Come on, it's mid-April. I know the weather translates to it, but get ready. It's going to warm up pretty soon. I'll have those details in a bit. Take a look at the uh, pollen count. I do want to point out that oak did drop. It's finally in the moderate category at 390. Mold, however, is high today. As for the aquifer, it's down a little bit, but it's still about six feet above average. And by the way, we are rounding the bend for oak season here. This is typically when we see the decline. So that is good news, worthy of a round of applause. Uh, if you like this cold weather, get ready for tomorrow morning. I'll break that down in detail and talk about the rest of the week coming up. Mayor and county judge having their daily briefing on the COVID-19 situation. Let's listen in. Tonight's update on the numbers, uh, we do now have 815 total cases confirmed of COVID-19 in San Antonio. Um, pleased to say that as of tonight, 141 individuals have fully recovered from the virus and we don't have any new deaths to report today. In the hospitals currently, we have 89 patients who are COVID-19 positive. An additional 49 people are in the hospital that are awaiting test results. And we have 54 people currently in ICU uh, that are confirmed positive for COVID-19. The hospital capacity continues to be uh, a strength for us. We have 38 folks on ventilators tonight, and that means 76% of our available ventilators are, are, for, are available to us. Uh, and we currently have 41% of our staffed beds available uh, to us in the hospitals. Uh, currently, our estimate is roughly 11,000 people in San Antonio now have been administered tests in San Antonio. Um, I do want to remind folks that, you know, we talk about these numbers every night and sometimes it's a blur. We know they're going up because testing is increasing and we're moving along uh, through the course of this pandemic here in San Antonio. But the numbers do represent people, families, patients with, um, you know, children, with husbands and wives, uh, people who are grandparents and, and, you know, sometimes children of uh, folks in our community. And so every single person has a story. And as we think about these numbers, also think about the first responders, the healthcare professionals, and also those families that are struggling to ensure that their loved ones are well. Uh, this is so important to consider as we talk about things like social distancing, physical distancing, the measures that we put in place to make sure that our neighbors are healthy, they're safe, and we save lives. We want to thank you for all the work that you're doing uh, to help make sure that San Antonio continues to be healthy and that we save lives during the course of this COVID-19 pandemic. Judge? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Thanks a lot. Uh, you know, it was just a, what, a week ago, I guess, that we just had one inmate test positive. Uh, we now have eight positive inmates with five more tests pending. We have sheriff's officers reporting 14 uniform officers and three civilians associated with the jail are positive. And the Bear County Facilities uh, Department has one positive case. So we, we're beginning to see the spread in the jail and I don't think it's gonna stop where it is. So we're constantly stepping up to try to do more to stem this tide of COVID cases within the jail. Uh, we've identified and isolated jail units where cases are identified. We've identified the medically at risk and who may have been exposed. Uh, we've isolated COVID patients and, and patients who are under investigation in the jail's medical infirmary. Uh, we've increased hygiene sanitation efforts. Uh, we're consistently contact, uh, contact tracking investigations of existing cases. And we've increased our capacity to conduct virus testing of symptomatic 
inmates and staff. And we're ranking up the symptom monitoring of inmates and jail staff. We hope to have in place to provide these symptomatic tests to 100% of the population by Thursday. And we're working to identify continuing need for uh, supplies with respect to uh, personal protective equipment. And we're securing sufficient uh, efforts of what we've got, but we've got to continue to bring in more. To show you kind of how we stack up, uh, in Dallas there's 32 inmates that have been tested positive and they have 192 people in quarantine. In Harris County, 43 have already tested positive, 97 inmates are pending test results, and 1,152 of the inmates are quarantined. So while our numbers are low, we expect to continue to have some issues at the jail, and we're taking all the steps that we can reasonably take uh, with respect to stemming the uh, tide of it. I would thank you, Judge. And I also want to report that um, the work that our working groups, that are a combination of the City Council and the Commissioner's Court, are moving along. We just had a work session of the City Council today. Uh, those are going quite well. We've gotten a lot of feedback uh, from the public as well as our court and our, our City Council in terms of things like data reporting and so forth. So we do want to uh, we do want to encourage you to get the latest information on the on COVID-19 in our community by going to the San Antonio website at sanantonio.gov slash COVID-19. And you can get text alerts if you text COSAGOV to 55000. Uh, this is a uh, constant effort to make sure that we have uh, information going out that's timely, that allows you to make informed decisions. So one of the things that we've been looking most forward to is compiling all the data um, and looking at how this curve is going to happen in our community. The peak of the cases and also how long those cases might last so we can begin to think about opening back up. That's been a topic of conversation here in San Antonio just like it is in Texas and throughout the country. And so to shed a little bit of light on that and the studies that we now are going to see uh, is Dr. Colleen Bridger, our former Metropolitan Health Director, someone who's uh, spent a career in this kind of research and now our Assistant City Manager. Colleen, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, yes, I do. I'm excited to talk about the, the models that we'll be using. We have been working with um, a number of different researchers and organizations, and where what, what we are excited to announce is that starting tomorrow, we will be um, posting four different models on our website, updating them as they become updated. One of those models will be um, from UTS, two of the models will be from UTSA. One of them will be from Oliver Wyman, which is an international consulting firm. And then one of them will be from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation out of the University of Washington. Um, I can tell you that essentially what we're seeing, not unlike um, those of us who've watched some of the um, hurricane maps, is that there are different projections about when we're going to peak what is the maximum number of cases we're going to see. Um, and so we're going to use this information along with a lot of other data um, to help us continue to make data-driven decisions around um, how we respond to this pandemic. Um, some of the, the data that we're seeing from these models estimate the peak of the pandemic here in Bear County to happen anywhere between late April and mid-May. So, you know, a couple of weeks on either side, just like when we're looking at hurricane maps, it may wobble a little bit to the east or a little bit to the west. That's kind of what we're tracking with this model as well. Um, the other data point that we're really interested in from these models is um, what are they projecting the total number of cases to be for uh, San Antonio and Bear County. And right now there's, there's a pretty big uh, gap between the smallest estimate, which is 1,100, and the largest estimate, which is 10,000 plus. So that I think will, will narrow in a little bit more as we get more and more data that we can feed into all of these different models and better understand what's, um, what to expect. And so Hi, Colleen, let me just tell you. All right, that's the latest briefing from the uh, 
County Judge Nelson Wolf, Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and you heard Dr. Colleen Bridger, who used to be the head of Metro Health, is now an assistant city manager. And it was interesting. Uh, we're at 815 total cases right now. No new deaths to report, which has been great. Uh, but she was talking about when we're going to see the peak and kind of the number of cases we may, may see total. They're going to put those projections actually out with the information that they have right now. Yeah, that's beginning tomorrow. And that's really the question on any and everyone's mind. When can we get back to normal? And I think tomorrow we'll get a better understanding of that. She said they'll be posting four different models on the city's websites. These are projections of when we will peak, as well as models that will project the total number of cases here in San Antonio and Bear County. So we can expect to start seeing those tomorrow. Yeah, interesting. The peak, she said, could is anywhere from late April to mid-May. That's when we're going to hit the height of it. It won't be when it's over, but it'll be the height of the cases. And the total cases could be, I mean, wide-ranging yeah. from 1,100 to 10,000 plus. Yeah. So we'll see those numbers get narrowed down. She described it as kind of like a hurricane trying to d the track of a hurricane. And another major issue we will continue to follow is, of course, uh, the news out of the Bear County Jail with eight now um, positive inmates testing there. And uh, obviously that's going to be something that we're going to continue to follow as this progresses. A major concern yeah. for sure. All right, let's go to Adam Kasky right now, who is uh, actually we're going to go to sports. We're going to talk about a NASCAR Howdy, driver who they didn't wait long to make a decision on his future. Now, less than 48 hours, and of course, this all has to do with what he had to say during a virtual race and why Chip Ganassi Racing Team has made that decision to fire that driver today. When we come back, more information about that and one of the biggest sporting events in the world called off coming up. NASCAR driver Kyle Larson was fired by Ganassi Racing less than 24 hours ago. He was suspended indefinitely by NASCAR for using a racial slur during an iRacing event on Saturday night. The incident occurred when Larson lost contact with his virtual spotter during the race, and his comment was aired during the live stream event. Ganassi's racing decision to fire Larson came after most of his major sponsors dropped him, including McDonald's, Credit One Bank, Five Serve, and Chevrolet discontinuing his personal services deal. 27-year-old driver was in the last year's contract with Ganassi was considered to be one of the top three Asian drivers to come, but now his actions have not only cost him his job, but his future in NASCAR for now. Larson did apologize for his mistake, but this is what Chip Ganassi had to say today regarding his decision to fire Larson. He said in part, after much consideration, Chip Ganassi Racing has determined it will end his relationship with Kyle Larson. As we said before, the comments that Kyle made were both offensive and unacceptable, especially given the values of our organization. Organization. As we continued to evaluate the situation with all the relevant parties, it became obvious that it was the only appropriate course of action to take. Meet the new head coach of the Johnson Jaguars football team. He's Mark Soto, who also carries the title of athletic coordinator at the school. Mark replaces Ron Riddiman, who opened up Johnson High School 12 years ago as their first football coach and last month decided to move on to Alamo Heights to become the Mules' new athletic director and head coach. Soto has a long history of football in San Antonio and the surrounding area, starting first with his playing days as a linebacker for Johnson High School in 1988 to 1990, where he helped win a state championship in 88 after their opponent had to forfeit the win in the state title game. He would go on to become the Rockets defensive coordinator and assistant head coach before moving on to become the head coach of the San Marcos Rattlers in 2012. It was there he led the Rattlers to the district title in 2017 with a 10-2 finish, all the while helping lead the drive to build a new stadium and student activity center. Now he takes over one of the most high-profile jobs in all of high school football while paying tribute to the legacy left behind by Coach Riddiman. Coach Ritterman has, has left a sustainable program. He's done a great job uh, building that program up. And, uh, you know, I'm just going to go in there and, and use what's great and, and, and enhance what, what needs a little bit of work on. So we're going to bring energy to the place, uh, make sure that we're attacking on defense, spreading the ball on offense, and being sound on uh, special teams. Not only does the Northeast School District have a new head coach, but they also have a new executive athletic director. He's Kelly Parker, who served under Karen Funk as a athletic director in the Northeast School District until he was promoted last night in a vote by the School District Board of Trustees. Karen is retiring at the end of this school year. The Tour de France has become the latest large sporting event to fall victim to the coronavirus. The world's most famous cycling event has been called off and is unclear at this time if it will be able to happen this year at all. But what is clear is that the three-week race event will not be starting on July. Should say June the 27th and the city of Nice is scheduled. That decision was all but made by French President Emmanuel Macron who told the nation in a speech on Monday that all public events with large crowds have been canceled until at least mid-July. The last time the tour was not held was back in 1946 when the nation was still emerging from World War II. So as we see other events canceled, now there's maybe some hope of some events starting up. We have more about that tonight coming up 
on the night beat. All right. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. All right, time now for our coronavirus Q&A. It's a segment that we do every day at this time. And joining us, as she does every Tuesday, is Dr. Ruth Berggren with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. First of all, thank you again for uh, joining us today. And um, Dr. Berggren, I want to start by asking you, we've heard a lot about this antibody testing. Folks who may have been carriers or and perhaps didn't know it, are you seeing some of this antibody testing happening here in San Antonio? And if so, what is it exactly? and what is that process like? So an antibody test is, means a blood test, and that blood test looks for proteins in your blood that say whether your immune system has recognized a particular pathogen, in this case, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. So there is now an FDA-approved antibody test for COVID-19, and that is awesome because we will be able to, without a whole lot of fuss, test people to see if they've already been exposed to the virus and if they have this these antibodies in their blood, then we can infer they've already been infected. What we don't know and what research will show us, and I think fairly soon, is whether the presence of those antibodies means that you're immune to getting infected or not. This is a really valuable tool because it means we'll have some handle on how many people in our community have already been infected by this virus and it will tell us so much about what we can expect going forward. As far as whether we're doing it yet or not, that's on hold, but we really think that's coming in the next week or two. And we're excited to get the test and we're excited to begin applying it to see what we can learn about our community. What would you say to people out there who were thinking that maybe they did go through this, maybe they, maybe they did, maybe they do have the antibodies and they're thinking about donating plasma? What would you say to them? So there is an op that's a bright spot. There is an opportunity if you have recovered from COVID-19, um, you can donate your blood, they'll take your plasma at our uh, blood and tissue center, South Texas Blood and Tissue Center, and they will of course verify whether that's the case and they will um, possibly be able to give your plasma to somebody who's actively sick with the disease and what we're hoping is that that will help that person recover. A lot of research needs to be done to see if that will actually work, but there are many, many precedents throughout history where convalescent plasma can be very beneficial to people who are actively suffering from the disease. Dr. Bergen, we've been talking for weeks, of, it seems like forever, about social distancing and the importance of that. Any indications that it's working here in San Antonio? Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing? There is no question. San Antonio has done an awesome job of social distancing and flattening the curve. I say this because I know that the numbers of cases in our hospitals has been fairly flat. Sure, we have an accumulation of cases. Sure, we have more people than we ever wanted to see on ventilators and more deaths than we ever wanted to see, but it could have been so much worse. And the models that we look at, a lot of smart mathematicians from universities around here are looking at this and they're showing us that um, our interventions, our early interventions have staved off tens of thousands of cases and thousands of deaths. There's no doubt about it, but we're not there yet. We're not done. So we have to hang in there and we have to keep doing what we're doing, but we know it's working. We talked about the peak last week and you said somewhere, you know, mid May is what you were looking at then for when we may see the peak in cases. Has that shifted at all in the studies and the models that you've looked at? You know, Steve, it's just too hard to say. Um, we, we, we do see some differences uh, depending on what kind of model is being looked at. And I, I, I think that it's still fair to say that May ish somewhere mid May. Um, is a reasonable estimate. Um, that doesn't mean we can let up though, and, and we doesn't mean we should do anything other than what we're doing right now, which is continuing to distance and stay home. Any other points of interest or anything else that you want our viewers to know before, before we wrap up with you? There are a lot of bright spots, right? This is a long haul and it's easy to get discouraged, so we have to look at the bright spots. And one bright spot is how generous San Antonians are. Incredible outpouring of giving to the food bank over the Easter weekend we saw. We've had continued gifts of PPE to the UT Health Science Center and also to UHS. So that's bright. San Antonians are, are generous human beings. 
And speaking of PPE, we have another bright spot, a, a team at University Hospital led by Dr. Tommy Austin, our chief nursing executive, has developed a substitute mask for the N95. And we could call it an N97 mask so that it, it is actually even more effective a little bit than the N95 at filtering out particulates. And this is made from surgical cloth and uses a piece of filter paper that, that is used in, in air conditioning. This has actually been designed here, submitted to the FDA, has been approved for use here during the emergency and may have utility beyond that. So lots of creativity um, and an FDA approval. We continue to accrue patients on our remdesivir trial. That's an antiviral that shows early promise already in some clinical trials. We have that trial ongoing at University Hospital. We have more, more patients getting onto it. We have people who are receiving convalescent plasma. That means a blood product from folks who have recovered from COVID-19 that's going on here in San Antonio. And we're proud that we can um, participate in that study. And there's an opportunity for people to donate that blood, as I said earlier. And finally, we're anticipating the arrival of the FDA approved antibody test that will let us know what's going on. And I even have another piece of good news. You know, we've heard so much about jails across the country and across the world and how they are places that are very vulnerable and our own jail is experiencing an outbreak. But we're getting rapid turnaround of testing there, which is good news and different than what's been happening with so much of our testing so far. The rapid turnaround in the testing is letting us identify who's sick so that we can isolate them and protect other people. So I think I've given you at least six things that are bright spots on our horizon and hope that this encourages everybody to keep up the good work. Believe me, with all that's going on, we'll take all the good news you can give us, Dr. Berger, and I appreciate it. And we'll see you tonight uh, during the nine o'clock news, about 9.13, 9.15. But thank you for joining us as you do every Tuesday. See you then. We'll be right back. A big day on the calendar coming up for pot smokers in Northern California. 420, April 20th, the mayor of San Francisco urging people to give it a pass this year. 420 has become associated with marijuana because of an old trend of smoking pot at 420 in the afternoon. In San Francisco, people gather for 420 each year in Robin Williams Meadow. This year, Mayor London Breed of San Francisco says the park will be closed. She says it's just not safe for people to celebrate with coronavirus still spreading like it is. All right, let's head on over to Adam Kasky, who is uh, actually we'll take a live shot of uh, downtown San Antonio before we head over to Adam Kasky, where it is a beautiful day out there. today. Very nice. Adam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gorgeous day today. We started off in the 40s, then we made it into the 60s this afternoon. So unseasonably cool. Feels fall like out there and get this tonight. We're going to have some 30s in the hill country. I'll break it down for you in detail in a few minutes. Also, one of our weather headlines are remaining unseasonably cool for the rest of the week and even the first part of the weekend. Rain chances right now, just a slight chance, but I'll show you what part of Texas actually got snow overnight. All that and much more coming right up. All right, hope everybody enjoyed the nice chilly day that we had today. <laughs> I know I did. <laughs> it was my kind of weather. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially when you see what other people are dealing with, snow and things like that. You know, I, I put on a long sleeve shirt. <laughs> Adam. Huh. Yeah, you know, actually, I was out for a long walk today with the kids. They were on their bikes, and I was out with my wife, and she had a hoodie sweatshirt on cinched around her face. <laughs> you know, I'm strolling along in my I shorts and too, short sleeves. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Every, it's a little different for everybody. I get it. I get it. But overall, it's been very comfortable out there despite feeling fall like. I mean, just look at the numbers. We started the day at 47. It's got 11 degrees below average. And we only made it to 68 for the afternoon high temperature when the average is 80. And right now, those clouds are starting to clear out. You can see that on city cam here. The clouds rolled in and now they're moving out and they're breaking up. So that's basically ripping off the blanket for the nighttime. So temperatures are going to drop off quickly. 66 degrees right now, dew point of 42 degrees and a relative humidity of 42%. Taking a look at the readings, for the most part, in the 60s. 69 in Castroville right now. Canyon Lake, you're at 62. Kerrville, already down to 59. And look what happens to temperatures as we go through the night and into tomorrow morning. These numbers are going to drop off quickly in the hill country. 
we're looking at mid to upper 30s for the vast majority of the hill country. You get around to San Antonio, 43 degrees for the low temperature, and then a little closer to 50, but that's down near Laredo. By the afternoon tomorrow, very similar to today, we'll tack on just a couple of degrees, right around 70 degrees here in town, and in the hill country, mid to upper 60s for highs. All right, take a look at the high temperatures here as we go through the rest of the week. No big changes through the work week and to start the weekend. Then we get to Sunday and especially into the early part of next week, and that's when we see the heat really return back up to near 90 degrees for high temperatures. All right, here's a look at the visible satellite imagery, and I mentioned that little cloud deck that moved in during the morning hours, and it really kept us from warming up beyond the 60s around town here. But now those clouds are eroding and they're dissipating basically right on schedule. So we're not gonna have that natural insulator tonight. All right, here's the wider view and I really wanna point out the extra cloud cover up in the panhandle. That's where we had the snow. I pointed it out last night as it was happening and then again early this morning you see on the radar imagery the areas of blue. That's snow in mid-April, and not just snow falling, but actually snow accumulating. From Lubbock to Amarillo, some pockets of the panhandle there picked up about two inches of snow measured by some of their weather watchers. So pretty impressive for uh, this time of year. And obviously it was a lot cooler up there as well for our friends in the panhandle with that snow. As for weather activity, our overall pattern's pretty quiet. Looking at the rain chance, 0% tomorrow, 0% on Thursday because we're looking at a lot of sunshine. Then we get into Friday, 20%. Uh, Saturday about a 30%. So we're not looking at anything widespread or anything real promising in terms of rain. This evening, clearing sky, unseasonably cool. Temperatures already down in the upper 40s by midnight. Not much of a breeze out there. And then tomorrow, we start the day at 43 here in San Antonio. Crisp outside, very fall-like. And then sunny and right near 70 into the afternoon. Looking ahead, I mentioned those rain chances, pretty slim. Temperatures in the basically in the low to mid 70s the rest of this work week and then into the weekend and next week we'll see the temperatures climb up a bit uh, back up to near 90 degrees now as i've been doing this weather i've had a couple of friends um crawling you can come here crawling around on their hands and knees it's okay you can come here you want to say hi josie you want to say hi they've been i don't know if you could hear them bouncing yes. around but crawling around oh hi josie here, tell, here no, come here tell us about your accessories tell us about your accessories <laughs> yeah, oh okay she's shy <laughs> Yeah. But I well, just I, I, I caught oh, you. Just got what? You got to show him. Oh, that's <laughs> adorable. Little toy. I need oh. to work on the work. Yeah, she loves her panda hat. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thanks, helpers. Callie, um, adjust the camera shot for me and does the focus as well. Wow. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, ladies. And provides the space for the studio. She does it all. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, it's coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. San Antonio City Council detailing what it's doing to address what is needed now and in the future to recover from COVID-19. As part of the initiative, Council has formed several community working groups that are each focused on different areas. The teams include social services, business and employment, government relations and housing and food services. The city is also working on a website to detail the teams and their initiatives and to offer a platform for people to voice concerns and ask questions. The San Antonio Fire Department updating protection guidelines for first responders. Fire Chief Charles Hood says the department now has two ambulance decontamination sites and they're now taking temperature checks three times a day. The department also has 840 potential rooms for isolation to offer to first responders and patients who may have been exposed to the virus. A group of biomedical engineers at JBSA Lackland are changing up their daily routines in an effort to get face shields to the health care workers who desperately need them. Now they've developed a way to 3D print components of face shields, which can then be easily pieced together and then shipped off to providers. Right now, the lab is capable of producing 25 face shields every 10 hours. A restaurant in Leon Valley is doing its part to give back to the community amid the coronavirus outbreak. With the help of workers and customers at Rita's Mexican Casina, the business has started to pay it forward to first responders working on the front line lines by dropping off meals throughout the week. We're just here to supply whatever we can do and so far it's been very well.
The fight against the COVID-19 outbreak continues, and a big part of that fight is actually coming from right here in San Antonio. Texas Biomedical Research Institute, the Southwest Research Institute, UT Health San Antonio, just to name a few of the institutions that are developing technologies that they hope will fight the COVID-19 virus. Yeah, and tomorrow night we're holding a virtual town hall with Mayor Ron Nirenberg and a few bioscience experts about the solutions they're exploring right here in San Antonio. If you have questions, we want to try and get you some of those answers. You can submit them right now on our website, ksat.com. Our panel of experts will be answering your questions live during the news at 6. We're going to be starting at 6.30 and then we'll be streaming the virtual town hall from 7 to 8 o'clock on our website on ksat.com and actually I think the stream starts at 630 so you get to see that part of it as well live on ksat.com see you on the night beat and